The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Isn't he altogether lovely? What uh, beautiful baptisms of the grace of our God. So beautiful to see those three young men surrendering their lives to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, This morning we're going to continue in 2 Peter, so if you'll turn with me to chapter 1. We're currently in this first section of 1 Peter, where Peter is helping these churches stand against false teachers of their age. And they're coming and they're teaching a false gospel. And the first line of defense that Peter is giving against false teachers is know your own salvation. Know it, be assured of it, and live into it. You know how they train people to spot counterfeit bills uh, in the banking industry is to to know the real so well that they can almost spot the false. And so Peter wants us to know our salvation, to to have full assurance of it, so that we won't look for new truths and fresh ways and new thoughts to give you assurance. You're full in Jesus Christ, and, and that will fight off false teaching when it promises you all these extra things. I have Christ, I need no other. That's where Peter is leading and guiding these sheep. So Peter starts with remember. Remember the forgiveness of your sin. Remember the gift of salvation, the gift of faith. We need to never get over it. We need to grow into it deeper and deeper. Be assured of it. That is where transformation will flow. A changed life will flow out of the full assurance of the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. So we are looking at this section, how to gain assurance, to make certain of your calling and election, to safeguard you against false teaching. The simple point is that God has done everything in Christ Jesus to save you. And He's given you His grace He's given you His power by connecting you to Jesus Christ so that last time we were together that you would grow in grace and peace. And the way that you're going to grow in grace and peace is by the knowledge of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The way this grace will grow and flow, the way peace will guard your mind and your heart is through the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. Seeing that His divine power, grace, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. What we've received by being joined to Christ is everything that you need for a life of godliness. And it comes again, he says, through the true knowledge, the epinosis of Him, Jesus, who called us by His own glory and excellence. So what Peter is telling us is that God has given us His divine power, so that we have everything we need for life. As we're going to look at transformation in verses 5 through 7, He's given everything that you need to become those kind of people. So how do I get this power? I want to be conformed into the image of Christ. Peter says, through. You get it through the true knowledge of Him who called you by His own glory and excellence. It's that word we've been looking at, epinosis. Gnosis is knowledge. Epi is a preposition to have full knowledge, to have this understanding, to have this gift of faith as you see the truth in Christ. It's not just academic. You see Him, you know Him, you get this. And so last week we said grace has not been deposited in a spiritual Fort Knox for you and now I got like an ATM and I walk up and say, God, I need grace for this. I need a little more grace for this. That is not how the Christian life works. It's not like Popeye where you just get spinach and you eat it and now you can go do things you couldn't do before. Rather, you've been joined in verse 4 to the divine nature. You've been joined to Christ. We will look at that next week. We live in a relationship then with the Lord Jesus Christ like a vine and a branch is what Jesus called it. It flows to us by our union, which brings communion with Christ. And the way this will flow is by the true knowledge of this Christ that we have been attached to, that we have been married to, that we've been joined into a mystical union with this Christ by grace through faith. And so I need to know Him, as Paul said. God has given us a Bible, and He's given us His Spirit and His church 
to grow in the true knowledge of Christ. Everything that we need to grow into godliness. This is how grace and peace will be multiplied to us that we looked at last week. Amen? That is how we will receive abundant and more and more grace and more and more peace, what we need for the Christian life. So this morning, (coughs) I want to park on this. And I want to try to make this so practical because I think we're upon one of the most important things in the Christian life. Because this knowledge of Christ is so important for all of grace will flow to us and through it. So we got to get this right. If you don't get this right, you'll never get uh, uh, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and agape. We will never get that we don't understand this. You will just be uh, external morality all of your days, playing around in Christianity and never truly changing into those kind of people. So we got to get the foundation to get a life of godliness. You can't bypass what we're looking at. This must be understood. Or you're going to have a form of godliness and deny its power, which is just filling our land. Just form with no power that God is talking about here in 1 Peter. God has given you power to be changed and conformed. Apart from your strength and your weakness, He will change you and transform you. So I want to get this power that says it comes through the epigenosis, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so let's look at what kind of knowledge this is. What does Peter mean by this in verse 2? And again, he uses the same word, in verse 3. And so this is the, the kind that many will not have on the last day. They won't have this kind of knowledge. I want you to hear what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So these are professors, Christians, professed Christians. Not everyone who says that will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, this intimate knowledge. I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They they didn't have the epigenosis. They, they They were doing the external things, but they never had an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to seek as a church is I want every soul in this room to have epigenosis. So I need you to know what that means, and I want you to get it this morning. I've been reading a book about John Newton by Tony Ranke, and it's been so rich to my soul that I'm going to borrow from it this morning because I've been learning the beauty of how Newton defined grace in, in the knowledge of Christ. William J. was a young pastor in London who had become a student of John Newton. In the fall of 1807, he was at the age of 38. And he brought a notebook and a pencil to meet with Newton for what would prove to be his final visit to his old friend. He was sick in bed. Newton was in his 80s at this time, and he was bedridden. His eyesight and his memory were all failing. And Pastor Jay was hoping for some last advice from his pastoral mentor as he entered into that room. And it turned out to be a very brief meeting. And the lines that he sketched down in his notebook from that meeting would be etched into history as John Newton's final words. And he said this, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Newton died a few weeks later after declaring that beautiful truth, the summary of that whole man's life. I remember two things. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. Four decades earlier, Newton wrote to his friend, he said, our sins are many, but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness, as we learned in verse 1, is greater. At another point, he wrote, we cannot be so evil as he is good. He said, though our sins have been deep dyed like scarlet and crimson, enormous as mountains and countless as the sands, the sum total is that sin has abounded. But where sin hath abounded, grace has much more abounded. Newton got the grace of God that it abounds over all of our sin. It covers it. It saves. It secures. 
And this is the truth that took John Newton, Newton's heart. And he said it's what drove him into the ministry that he could preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ to proclaim this grace of God the rest of his days. He said, this includes all I can wish then for my dear friends, that you may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. To know him is the shortest description of true grace. To know him better is the surest mark of growth in grace. And to know him perfectly is eternal life. So I want to look at how Newton grew in grace by growing in the true knowledge, the epigenosis of Jesus Christ. That is what's missing from our day and age in America. This is what the enemy will spend all of his days keeping you from. He loves external religion. He'd let you play that forever. But he doesn't want people who are beholding Christ in this epigenosis way and, and being transformed and changed into his image. And so I'm going to borrow from Newton and some of the truths of Christ that he grew in this morning. The ones that we must grow in if we're ever going to grow in the grace and the peace of God. And we're going to look at six of them this morning. And I'll tell you this, they're not exhaustive. But I just want to teach and show you what does it look like then to grow in epigenosis. So we're going to look at six examples. And I, I hope when we're done, you'll, you'll get this. And then you'll see that there's hundreds of this, these uh, ways of knowing Christ in the Bible. And so my, my prayer is that every one of you would understand epigenosis and the joy and the pleasures of knowing Christ. I was praying before I came out this morning with one of the brothers, two of the brothers in the church, and the one just said, I can't wait to see you by sight. I just want to hug you and thank you for what you've done for me. Epigenosis, longing for this Christ. <clears throat> so let's look first at being a shepherd. Jesus Christ is a shepherd. Newton saw the shepherding language of God throughout the Old Testament. He saw it in the exodus of God's people out of Egypt as a very typological picture, he said, of the entire Christian life. In Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 14, I'm just, I think I'm going to, yeah, I'll take time. Let's read it. For the Lord's portion is his people. His portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land in a howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign god with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and he ate the produce of the field. He made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat of the lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats with the finest of the wheat and of the blood of grapes you drank wine. And I want to give you Newton's translation of this interpretation. He said, The sinner, fast bound in slavery to his own sin, is delivered by a miracle and shed blood free to walk for 40 years in a wilderness, sustained by God, along a path toward the eternal rest of the promised land where we're all a journeying. The Christian life, he said, then is exodus and exile. But the redeemed never walk this path alone. Christians walk together, never far from our good shepherd who leads and guides us in even the darkest nights in the desert. Left to ourselves, we wander off into thistles and danger in the wilderness of these years that we call earth. <clears throat> Our good shepherd sustains us. He tames the ravens, which he said provides our necessities, and he tames the lions, which he protects from dangers. This Exodus metaphor is frightening because sheep are defenseless. They cannot fight. They cannot run with much speed, and they have little foresight or sense of danger. Little do we appreciate the danger we face at every moment of life, says Newton. All of our attempts at self-preservation are laughably insufficient. We're poor and silly sheep, unable to add one inch to our statures by all of our worry. The fortresses we build around our souls for protection are castles of cardboard. The dangers we face far exceed our frail powers to defend ourselves. 
Our vulnerability and weakness draw out God's compassionate love and care as the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and because of that, I shall not want. So just knowledge can say the Lord is my shepherd. Epigenosis says the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything by this knowledge of the good shepherd who cares and nurtures and is leading me to my true home. When I get this, I'm telling you, I I can lay down in green pastures. I don't want, because I have everything in Christ. Nothing else can tame our anxieties and our insecurities. I'm taken up with 20 things that I can do nothing about. All are unnecessary if the Lord is my shepherd. I need to get this. I need to, it's got to go past academic, from the head to the heart. You're my shepherd. I shall not want. That changes people. It transforms them. Grace flows and peace comes upon those kind of people. This is the cure for anxiety and worry, not a pill. We have to grow in this knowledge. Do you see why this is epigenosco? To just know that he's your shepherd academically, that does nothing for you. That's not comforting you at all this morning. But to know it, to know it the way Peter's praying, is where it works into your mind and your heart to where you conclude, I shall not want. That's the kind of knowledge that we're looking for. And I don't want you to miss this whole morning. It's the kind of knowledge that we grow in. None of you have it perfect. We're going to keep growing in this knowledge of Christ. So we're we're on this journey of growing in the good shepherd and learning what it means and how I can want for nothing. This knowledge is how I can praise God for what's behind me and how I can cheerfully trust God for what is to come because he's my shepherd. That is the grace of God. And that produces peace to where you genuinely can lay down in green pastures because God's got me. And I don't have to solve and fix everything. And and in the midst of all this life, I can literally lie down because he's my shepherd. Christian, he'll guide us into paths that do not always cut through rose gardens, but they will always be the right path to our true home. The good shepherd will strengthen and sustain us in every path he leads us on, including the shadow of the valley of death. We hear his voice and his word, and we follow him, and he leads us to green pastures and still waters. He restores our soul, and he guides us in the path of righteousness. Until we reach the porch of the house of the Lord, we're going to dwell with him forever. The good shepherd, to know him as such, we follow his all-sufficient voice, said Newton, until we arrive at his all-sufficient face. And so that is the journey of the Christian life. And so I'm going to ask you before God is, do you have this kind of knowledge? I was praying that the saints of God would be so comforted this morning and that those who do not know Christ would be tutored to him this morning because you know nothing about what I'm talking about. You you know externals. And And I'm asking, do you know this? Do you have this kind of knowledge? Do you know this? This is why we're to grow in it. You keep growing in this and grace will be multiplied to you as you look at the good shepherd and follow after his voice. I I pray you know something of this kind of knowledge of Christ. Second, I want to look at the idea that Jesus is a husband. He's the husband who, who willingly weds himself to us. He takes us to be his bride in a marriage. And in verse four, he says, you become a partaker of the divine nature. So he takes on the responsibility of all of our debt, our sin. All of his honor and riches are now ours, we learn in verse 1. All of his righteousness is given to you. You stand in the full righteousness of Christ this morning. And he changes our name to bride of Christ or child of God. You get a new name. I'm the bride of Christ. And Christ now deals with us with great affection as is proper to his bride. This day, 30 years ago, I stood on an altar with my wife and we made vows and covenanted before God to love each other till death 
do us part. And how I look at this woman now, 30 years later, there's something within my heart that just wants to love, protect, guide, nurture, and I just love this woman, and I'm thinking, think about Christ. Could it be that the perfect bridegroom looks at me the same way? He looks at me as a bride ready to give all his resources for my good. We're given, we're, we are given his great love, his tenderness, his sympathy. His life is for us to be sanctified and pre- presented spotless without blame, uh, blemish on the last day. He's given to present you pure and see you made holy and spotless. We now have face-to-face affections and, and intimacies. We're not Stoics. This isn't just memorized doctrines. You are married to Jesus Christ with an intimacy and communion that God has bought at Calvary by the highest picture of human realm marriage. Nothing more intimate, nothing more committed as a bridegroom. God says this is what Jesus is to you. He is a bridegroom. And I want you to listen to Newton on this. The affections and beauty and mutual love in the greatest marriage on earth are but an echo of the beauty in the gospel. Best marriage you've ever seen on this earth is just a little echo of the beauty of this marriage that you have to Christ. What I have tasted in my earthly marriage is but a shadow of this greater marriage that we have with Christ. And we're going to grow in the experiential knowledge of relationship with Christ in this way. Are you growing in this knowledge? This is epigenosis. Or does talk like this just seem emotional and ridiculous to you this morning? Let's get back to the hypostatic union of Christ. If you've tasted of grace, you are growing in this intimacy with Christ as your husband. And Peter's praying that you would grow deeper in this knowledge of Christ. The writer of the book, Rinke, says, faith in Christ is far more than intellectual assent and stoic rationalism. As the husband of the church, Christ weds the church. In our participation with him, we now experience an intimate, vital, and inseparable union with Christ. And one day history will be consummated when the husband enters into the eternal marriage with his bride, the church, at the end of the age. Listen to it in Revelation 19. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of many peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints." And he said to me, right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God as we wait for the consummation of our marriages to Christ. Come, Maranatha, come back, Lord Jesus. The the wedding feast has been planned. The all-sufficient husband is in place. I pray that you will grow in this kind of knowledge of your husband. There is so much to be had in this full Christ who offers himself to you. That is what epigenosis is. Third, it's a prophet. He's a prophet. Since the fall, we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We become foolish in our thinking. We forget God and we worship our own doings. We, we were, were in darkness and we were hopeless, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Christ, the all-sufficient prophet, who has disclosed the invisible God to us. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There, he said in John 1, 9, there was the true light coming into the world that enlightens every man. And later in verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, Jesus has exegeted him. He has explained him. He's shown him forth. Newton likens the riches of divine grace of Scripture the precious jewels that are locked away in a thick safe. The door must be unlocked and opened for the true value to be discovered. This is the work of Christ. 
as the prophet, he is the door that opens the riches of divine truth in Scripture to the eyes and the heart of the Christian. He gives you epigenosis. He opens it up. He shows you the fullness of what is there. He gives us new hearts. He opens our eyes so that now we see the incredible riches in the Word of God. It's your treasure. That's why he's the logos, the, the, the Word of God. Christ is the disclosure of the invisible God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To grow in the true knowledge of Christ is to grow in seeing the truth of the Godhead, seeing the glory and the beauty of the Trinity. I am growing and seeing who my God is. And that is why in our attribute study, whenever I've taught it, I close everyone with the attribute of Christ who is a, a physical form to show us the beauty and the glory of our eternal God. Here's the revealer of God. May we grow in the knowledge of God. We need these Bibles to keep growing and seeing the glory and the beauty of who our God is. And Christ the prophet will keep revealing the Godhead to you. I want to grow in knowledge of this God. Fourthly, he's a priest. He's the perfect and pure priest who died a criminal's death, although he was absolutely innocent. When a hardened criminal would hang on a cross, I read that people would walk by and most people would just, they didn't want to look at it. They just wanted to walk by for the shame and just get by it. But with Jesus, they stopped and they mocked and they scorned and they shook their heads and spit on him. They mocked his character. They mocked his message, his person. He was a despised priest, rejected by men, and on that cross, rejected by God. He was the holy sacrifice. His blood would be poured out. He was the holy priest, transacting with a holy God on our behalf. There's only one ultimate and final mediator who acts between God and man. It's Christ Jesus. He's a priest. So how could the true God and giver of eternal life be despised and rejected and hang there in death? Christ was the Lamb who absorbed the full wrath of God on that cross. He will be the focal point for all the worship for all of eternity as the Lamb that was slain for our sins. The substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ is the epicenter of ministry. Newton wrote to a pastor friend, he said, I advise you by all means keep close to the atonement. Don't ever get away from the one who, who atoned for our sins, the wrath of God. He made it right between God and man. He said, never drift from that message. It's the message of grace. He said, the doctrine of the cross is the son of the system of truth. It's seen by its own light and throws light upon every other subject. The cross gives you light for every other truth. He said, this will soften hearts that withstand threatenings, the threatenings of God. This is actually what will soften their heart is the cross. This opens a door of hope to the vilest, to despairing sinners. The strictness and sanction of the law must be preached to show sinners their danger. But the gospel is the only remedy, and it suggests those motives which are alone able to break off the sinner from his love of his sins and enable him to overcome the world. We will look at that in uh, verse 4 next week. So only the full and sufficient atonement of Jesus Christ has the power to, to break the power of canceled sin. So it breaks our guilt and it breaks its power to illuminate all other divine truth, to order all doctrines to be the one thing needful and the only thing sufficient to silence unbelief and pride and provide us solid ground for hope and assurance. At age 65, I want to read a letter that Newton wrote to a fellow pastor. The older I grow, the more I'm drawn to preach much concerning the person, the atonement, and the glory of the Savior, and the influences of the Holy Spirit. There are other truths important in their places, but unless beheld through the medium of the cross, they have but a faint effect. As I'm closing out my life, I just want to preach more and more of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I want you to know that. I don't want it stuck here. I want you to know the freedom and the beauty and the glory of this cross for you.
With the passing of years, I'm finding my cherishing of the, the atonement of Jesus Christ more and more. Are you growing in the knowledge of the cross? Such a, oh, I like the hymn, it has such a wondrous attraction to me. I will cherish the old rugged cross until I exchange it one day for a crown. I love this cross. Epigenosis of a Savior that hung on it and saved you from your sin. Do you have that kind of knowledge of the cross? Or can you just show all the different nuances of it? I pray you know this. Fifth, I want to show you a king. Christ, round, Christ now reigns as the all-sufficient king. He's seated at the right hand of God in victory. Newton said he fought, he bled, he died, but in dying he conquered. He destroyed death and dis dis disarmed it of its sting. He destroyed him that had the power of death, Satan. He shook, he overturned the foundations of his kingdom. He broke open his prison doors, released his prisoners, delivered the prey right out of the hand of the mighty. Through the cross, the king is one. He's the king of glory. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He's the all-sufficient king. All things are under his control. He's in charge of everything, political processes, the collapse of kingdoms, uh, revolutions, all unfold toward the final cause of the kingdom of God. He's governing everything. And we grow in this. We're to grow in an epigenosis, a knowledge where I surrender and trust and obey. Robin Conwell talked in Sunday school about this, uh, not my will, but your will, O oh God. That is our battle, to grow in epigenosis. Not my will any longer, day by day, but it's your will, O oh God. Your will. We need epigenosis of this king. That I know what it means to have him rule and reign over my life. Can't name Christ and not have him be your king. You don't take half of Christ. I'll take a savior, but I don't want a king. You come to the only Christ there is who's a savior and a king. And we must learn experientially what it means to have this king rule over every area of my life. Everything under Christ. I'm going to close with one more. That's that he's a friend. Newton said he cherished this name the most. He loved that Christ was his friend. <clears throat> no sin or weakness in his friends withholds Christ's free and endless love. No greater love than this than one lay down his life for his friends. He was so willing to lay down his life as a ransom for his friends who were enemies while he laid it down. The friend has saved us. He's given us uh, eternal joy and comfort. What a friend. How hard the Christian life and journey is. The longer I live, there are so many trials in my own life and just shepherding a flock. It is unbelievable what comes into our lives. And our friend breaks in again and again and brings us through the trial. My favorite part of being a pastor is watching God lead each one of you through the trials that he brings into your life. He's such a good shepherd. He leads you through every path that every one of you have endured. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And for such friendship, all I can think of is we're terrible friends, aren't we? We're forgetful, faithless, disloyal, Yet our neglect and mistrust and disobedience does not diminish his love for us. He's steadfast in his friendship toward us. He is the friend that we wish we could be. Don't you wish you could be like that? He's the friend that you've been looking for on earth and you're just always disappointed. You know why? You're looking for Jesus. You keep, every friend has disappointed you your whole life and you're bitter and angry. What you're looking for is a friend like Jesus Christ who's always there. He's always doing the right thing for you. He never leaves you or forsakes you. He's the all-sufficient friend that we have always wanted and always needed. Christ Jesus, it is He. What a friend. Newton says, Jesus is always near about our path by day and our bed by night. Nearer than the light by which we see or the air we breathe. Nearer than we are to ourselves. <laughs> so that not a thought, a sigh, or a tear can escape his notice. Jesus is not just a buddy or pal. Christ binds our friendship through the highest sacrifice ever conceived. 
Never before has there been a friend who paid pure sinless blood for his friends. What a friend we have in Jesus. Friend becomes for Newton, he said, an affection-loaded shorthand title to embrace the full scope of Christ's all-sufficiency personally applied to us. All of his sufficiency is given to us because he is our friend. To know this Christ, to know this Christ intimately is epigenosis. It's the full knowledge. And as we grow in this knowledge, we're going to grow in the grace and the peace of God. If you, just those little six things, if you could get them, it would change and transform your life of your fears, your anxieties, why you can't overcome sin. Just knowing those could change your life. I got one last live real example to help you understand epigenosis. If you're not in the Hebrews class because you're at home sleeping, oh, that's, the, uh, I think, the unpardonable sin. Uh, <laughs> you, you blew it. So what I'm seeing in this Hebrews class is I, I'm seeing Christ so beautifully. And, and God has taken the man who's teaching it, and he's given him a, a brilliant earthly mind, but that isn't the beauty. The beauty is all this, taking all this knowledge and getting in the Scriptures and every week, he, he just finishes where you're looking at the diamond of Jesus Christ. We close with a great hymn every week, just exalting this Christ. So we're, we're gaining knowledge that's beautiful in the Word of God. But what it's doing is stirring our affections to love this Christ and saying, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. And that's epigenosis. So I'm not against knowledge. You've got to have that. You've got to get in the Scriptures. But where we don't end in Hebrews is just studying the, the, the data. We end at the feet of Jesus Christ, worshiping every Sunday. That's what we're talking about. Just not gnosis, epigenosis. I, I just can't learn and just pl- put it here and say, I'm smarter. Thank you, God. I know a little bit more. I want to know you, that I may know Him. And all this truth and this word is to show you Jesus and to know him more intimately. And as you grow in that, you're going to grow in grace, the power of God working through your life. And you're going to have a peace that no trial or the devil, anything can take it away from you. And the only protection, I got to grow in my knowledge of Christ. I got to get in this word and get with his people. I've got to know this Christ and I'll never be happy with just head knowledge got to get to the to the to the bride the bridegroom right i got to get to my friend my priest my king i got to have a good shepherd to where i don't want cuz i know him i know this good shepherd newton said he could add to this list he's our life he's our way our end our head our root our meat our drink our portion our strength our hope Our foundation, our sun, our shield, our example, our forerunner, our all in all. He's he's the all of history points to him. He's he's just uh, he's our our hope of the cross, the resurrection. He's coming again. He's seated at the right hand of God. It just know this Christ. All of this book, he says, it pointed to me. So if I get in here and I miss Christ, you're missing the whole Christian life. And so I'm praying for every one of you to grow in the epigenosis of Jesus Christ, to get in that secret place, to seek his face, to know him, trust him, love him. Don't be satisfied living six inches from the the vine. Do not do that. When he said, come all the way, come to me. Don't stay a foot away. Don't stay in just church. Come all the way to me and I'll give you rest for your soul. Weary soul that can never rest. Come to Christ. Quit stopping at Southside Bible Church. It's not enough. Come all the way to the sweet Christ. And in Him you'll find uh, just a wellspring of life bubbling up to this sweet Christ who I've come to know and love. May we grow in this. I'm going to close with one last quote. So you might have thought, man, all he preached was Newton. I'm trying to preach the scriptures by using a man who who got it. And the next week we'll dive back in 
uh, to these words. In verse 4, it, I, I, verse 4 could be my favorite verse in the Bible. Could be. So here's your last quote. But Jesus has unsearchable, inexhaustible riches of grace to bestow. The innumerable assembly before the throne have been all supplied from his fullness. And yet there's enough to spare for us also here this morning. And for all that shall come after us, may he give us an eager appetite, a hunger and thirst that will not be put off with anything short of the bread of life. And then we may confidently open our mouths wide, for he has promised to fill them. There's such sufficiency for Christ, we can all have a full meal deal. And everyone who comes after us, it, you just drink from it, it never depletes. It's just eternal sufficiency in Christ. So let's all drink. Let's go. He's not going to run out. There's enough for all of you. I can offer it again and again and again and never fear he's going to run out. Everything in Christ. More of Christ. And I'm telling you, this is where spiritual growth will find its fuel and power. If you skip this, you're sitting here today, a frustrated Christian who can't, you can't change. You're not getting anywhere. Every resolution that you made in New Year's is already broken. And you're not getting changed. It's because you're skipping the vine. You're skipping the beauty of epigenosis of Christ. And you're just looking for some little academic thing that might be the next thing that gets you free of this sin that has dominion over you. And next week, he's going to tell you that this, this fellowship with Christ can break the power of all of our sins. And so you skip this, and I promise you, you're living a defeated life. You've forgotten the forgiveness of your sins. And so I invite all of you back to your first love. Come back to this sweet Christ. Know, love, and, and hear me, you grow in it. So don't be discouraged that you've got a lot, of, a lot of room to grow, don't you? We get to grow in this for all of eternity. And I'm, I'm just bidding you, let's grow in it. Let's grow in it. Let's know this Christ. And from that will bubble up fruit that will give glory to God for all of eternity. Let's see that power that's available to those who abide in this vine. Let's pray. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who's never come to Christ, they stopped short. They stopped short of being baptized. They stopped short of joining a church. They stopped short of getting their, their reformed doctrine. And they stopped short of Jesus Christ. God, this morning, would you give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Let them hear your voice. And let them come all the way to Jesus Christ this morning. God, let them right now in the quietness of their heart repent and believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let them call upon Christ to rescue them from a form of religion but have denied its power. O oh Christ, who delights to save, would you rescue any in that place here this morning? And God, encourage your people. We cry that I, I, I don't know you as I should or ought or could, but be because of the way I know you, I'm not the same. And so God, would you deepen every one of our epigenosis of Christ. Deepen every one of us to know him more. Let that be the hunger of our heart. I want to eat this bread till I want no more. God, put that in every one of our hearts. Let that be the core of this church. Let it be the root of our fellowship that we stir each other up to know and love this Christ. And every trial, we point each other back to this beautiful Christ. And every, everything that will come into any life here, Christ is a remedy. He's sufficient for every need in this body. And God, let us know that, see it, and share it, and sow it into each other's hearts, and go tell the world of a Christ who can rescue them from their death. Oh God, thank you for our time here this morning. And I pray now as we close with that great epithumia of fear that binds so many hearts and the cure is to have epigenosis that I am a child of God Lord, let us know what that means here this morning and that every fear now would be cast out by your perfect love. God, let us worship you together. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.